very first thing is, of course, why investigate lightweight M2M and MQTT? And I think one of the one of the most important places to start here is that this sort of implementation choice, right? Uh, determining what the best communications protocol is, both for your telemetry and for your device management, really informs a lot of what else is going to happen further down in the stack as you're sort of designing and architecting and starting to build out your specific IoT implementation. And it's particularly important because unlike some other software stacks out there in the market, uh, Typically, IoT solutions have longer life cycles and can be much more costly um, or even difficult to physically access, but can be much more costly to sort of update, change, and rework and refactor in the same way that you might typically, um, you know, change different software solutions or different communications protocols in other parts of your stack. So this is also typically one of the first entry points when people are making their sort of architectural decisions. So we think it's very important to investigate uh, from this context. Second point is that you know every enterprise wants to find the right balance between time to market, but also something that enables you know future-proof solutions, something that's extensible and capable, and has you know a good sort of future plan forward as uh, as time goes on. So you know you, you really want to make it not overly complicated, but you want to make sure that you're not cutting corners now that kind of maybe accelerates your time to market a little bit, but you pay for it heavily later, especially you know, if your solution is successful and you're trying to scale it out or scale it up, um, you know, that's not the time where you want to be dealing with questions around changing protocols or doing sort of refactors of your, your core uh, communications protocol. So it's very important to decide this upfront. Um, and three, just to sort of reemphasize this one more time, you know, the choices you make now can limit the choices that you can make later. Um, and, you know, choosing a flexible and extensible stack from day one while it may be slightly more complicated at times to get the you know your first you know test or trial or poc up and running it really can make your life uh, a lot better uh, as you iterate down the road and then the very last reason um, we thought this is particularly important to do this sort of comparison is just sort of the lack of replicable quantitative data about the relative efficiencies and performance of, of lightweight m to m and mqtt uh, both from a technical perspective, but also from a bit of a sort of business and implementation perspective. Um, we'll be talking more about the technical perspective today, although we have lots more details in the white paper, which we encourage you all to download and take a look at. Um, but yeah, those are sort of our reasons for why we're here and why we did this investigation into these two different stacks. Um, and now I believe I hand it over to you, Marcin. Thanks, Sam, for this introduction. Now let's take a step back for a moment. Uh, connected cars is a simple example of a complex IoT system. As you know, uh, every car has a number of uh, IoT devices inside it, like a unit controlling collision avoidance, cruise control, operation of tires, and so on. They talk over uh, some local network with a central component that plays the role of, uh, of an IoT gateway. And this gateway is using a mobile network to talk with the IoT service that is located in the cloud. Uh, in the same time, it's also important to understand that gateway can execute some custom logic as well. So it can be aggregating data coming from multiple devices. It can be filtering some information. It can be providing some artificial intelligence functionality to, to, to provide a quick input for the, for the devices in the car. And in the cloud, uh, we have the running IoT service that is responsible for uh, device for system management, for the monitoring, but also for the business logic of the, of the whole IoT service. And it's also important uh, to understand that, you know, I'm talking about the cloud service and cloud deployment, but identical system can also be deployed uh, in an on-premise scenario. So this is uh, the example of one car. And then you can think that there can be, you know, many cars on the road. Each of these cars can have multiple devices. So the number of devices in your IoT system can, can scale up very quickly. So uh, this calls, if you think about this uh, amount of devices, this calls for, a, for, for, for implementation of the device management and monitoring system. And if you, if you think what it means, then this actually re reduces to two general questions. 
how do I know that my system works correctly? And if I have to do something, how can I control my device? Then if you keep thinking about this, uh, questions, then this raises considerations. First of all, is about, you know, hostile environment that uh, your device can be operating. There is a possibility that uh, your device gets compromised. What's next? What, 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 what happens then? Uh, do I know, do I have guarantee that my device is able to communicate securely? Then the second aspect is about need for monitoring. Do I know that everything is working properly? And finally, for management. So if my device is running, sometimes I need to update it because there are critical security bugs that needs to be fixed. Or sometimes I just have a new software that I want to update. And also it's, also, it's possible that your device gets old uh, and you want to retire it. Or sometimes it stopped working for whatever reason and it's just enough to reset it. So all of this, all of these things uh, fall into the category of management, and they need to they need to be addressed properly. If if we think then further, then uh, with with all these considerations uh, that that we have done a moment ago, then we can talk about challenges of managing the the big IoT system at scale, and we defined five categories of these challenges. First is security, security, and I say once more security. Uh, this is a challenge of, of paramount importance these days. There are many threats. We are operating on constrained devices that lack security by design approach when, when building an applications. And in many of these devices, keys are not stored in a secure way. This poses threats of uh, the data spoofing, data tampering, user masquerading, device masquerading, denial of service attacks, and so on. And there is a there is a basically a need to there is a need to make sure that there is a secure registration of devices and secure authentication and communication. The second aspect is interoperability. We have different classes of devices uh, produced by different manufacturers using different communication protocols operating in heterogeneous networks. And they sometimes need to be integrated with third party solutions. So all of this calls for using open standards in order to avoid the situation of a vendor locking. The third challenge is about constrained devices. We have limited power, limited memory, limited connectivity and processing capabilities. So we must avoid uh, connection processing overheads. So we have to look for solutions that minimize these overheads and Whenever we are doing some operations on the devices, we have to do them in a smart way. So for example, if you are doing your firmware over the air update and your battery is just uh, supplied, uh, your device is, is driven by the battery supply and your battery is low, then maybe it's not a good idea to do it at this moment because the device may, for example, run out of battery during this process and what will happen next. Then scalability, another important aspect. Uh, if you talk about the scale, it is impossible to track every single device. You need to have a way to somehow group them and you need to think how to automate the whole process of management, uh, monitoring of these devices, provisioning and being able to discover uh, what's happening with them and, and uh, the, the, dis discovering what, what's happening. And then in, in an automatic way. And finally, availability. So uh, this, this, these are two aspects to consider here. Availability of your device. Your device can be working fine, no problem. But there is also a whole network layer between your device and your IoT management system. So you need to make sure that the network is available. You have uh, proper, you need to monitor it. You have proper mobile subscription. If you are using cellular network, your quota for the mobile subscription is not run out of. These are the challenges that we need to meet. And now I'm handing it over to Sam to talk about MQTT. Thank you, Marcin. So yeah, so I think it's really interesting to hear about those those challenges. And before we get into a little bit of you know some of the different ways we can address them, let's just take a, a top level view of what is MQTT and, and what is lightweight M to M. So as many of you are probably familiar, um, MQTT is a machine-to-machine -machine or IoT connectivity protocol, which offers efficient lossless message delivery. 
And for better or for worse, it is been it has been and and currently is really the de facto communications protocol um, used by enterprises deploying IoT. Um, MQTT has been around for a while. Um, it's been standardized for nearly a decade. Um, was originally developed uh, as a constrained network protocol, um, I believe in the oil and gas industry. Um, these days, 3.1.1 is, is sort of the de facto standard out there. Um, there is a version 5, which does offer some new features, although it's broadly the same underlying concepts um, in many ways. And we haven't really seen too much of that adoption of, of version 5 yet. So 3.1.1 is really what's, what's out there in the wild right now. Um, I think one of the interesting things is that it is actually a very efficient protocol itself. It has very little overhead. But what's interesting is it has a completely unstructured payload. And we'll get into a moment why that's particularly important. Um, but one of the other things to note about it is that MQTT uh, uses TCP as its underlying transport, which offers some benefits, but also a lot of limitations, specifically when we're talking about uh, constrained networks and you know power constrained or, or compute constrained devices. There are some extensions to MQTT, such as MQTT SN or MQTT for sensor networks, which does support UDP and non-IP transports, but unfortunately it's not very widely adopted um, and is not nearly as well sort of standardized in practice as it perhaps should be. Um, again, so we'll come back to that unstructured payload now. So I think it's important to note here too that MQTT uh, defines really just the the messaging layer itself. It doesn't say anything about what types of messages you should send or what types of messages you should expect if you're subscribing. So we'll take a look at the, um, well, and this is really, I guess the important part here is this is in contrast to lightweight M2M as well, where there is a much more defined specification around that. Um, and we'll get into that in a moment. The very last point to make around MQTT here is that um, it follows the, the publish subscribe broker-centric paradigm. So if we take a look at the next slide, we can see you know, a very simplistic layout of what an MQTT uh, message sort of lifecycle or workflow might look like. So we see on the left, we have our temperature sensor, which could be some IoT device or a gateway or whatever. And it communicates northbound to this MQTT broker. And it does that by publishing a message of some arbitrary contents to the broker itself. And from there, individual clients that are northbound of, of the broker, they subscribe to those topics. And whenever I publish a message to that topic, they then get, a, they basically then receive the message themselves from the broker. So we support basically a, a fan out kind of architecture there. Um, and there are some other details uh, that can be involved here in terms of things like QoS levels and how you subscribe and some other uh, details, but this is sort of the overall big picture of, of what MQTT is like. So I think now we wanted to get into some more details of lightweight M2M, -M, so I'll hand that over to you, Marcin. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for this MQTT aspects. Uh, lightweight M2M, -M, this is how, how is it called in the, with, with the full name. The standard, the protocol has been developed as part of this OMA spec works activities and the activity on this one started around year 2013 so quite many years after MQTT was developed and it was from scratch designed for supporting the, the type of machine-to-machine -machine communication especially for the remote management what is in, important is that the architectural design closely is clo closely based on the race idea which makes it easy to be interoperable with web systems and HTTP protocol uh, running, 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 running under the running together with the with the co-op, and uh, Sam has mentioned that uh, MQTT does not define any payload information, whereas for for LWM 2 M we have an extensive amount of resources and data model that has been defined and standardized by IPSO. So if if you so basically in, in this approach you can just you know take whatever is standardized, uh, reviewed by, by people who work on the standards. So there is a, there is a high chance, you know, that, that this, this makes a lot of sense and you don't, you, you can just take it and, and it's not, it's not anything that you have to think about and, and reinvent the wheel. 
And finally, it is built on the data transfer protocol that is called constraint application protocol, COAP, which is specifically optimized for usage in the constraint environments. If we take a look at the stack of the LWM2M and we take the top-down approach, on top, we have the, the IoT application is running, and then this application is talking or managing the objects, which are part of the data model that is defined by IPSO. And then these objects are talking with the actual LWM2M protocol implementation. And this implementation is, uh, provides four main interfaces. Interface for boot device bootstrapping. This is the phase where the, where the device is onboarded, the credentials are being passed to the device. And the interface of registration. So devices once in a while need to register to the server in order to, to so, so, that, so that you know the server can understand that device is alive and everything is happening is, is fine with it. Uh, interface for uh, device management and monitoring. And finally, for uh, information reporting. So we have all, all of these functionalities of management and messaging uh, on, this, on this layer. And then LWM2M runs on top of the co-op, as we have mentioned before. So co-op is the adaptation of the HTTP transport protocol for the uh, for the constraint environments, so it's a lightweight binary encoded protocol. And what is interesting about it is that it's uh, interoperable with HTTP. So there are proxies that uh, make it easy to translate the co-op message into HTTP message and back. So this provides a good interoperability with the with this web part of the internet. Uh, this also means that much, all of the REST, re REST requests or REST messages that are uh, exchanged over HTTP can also be easily translated to co-op co messages. And as part of co-op, we have also OSCOR, which is the security protocol that provides end-to-end -end encryption on the application layer. And below co-op, we have the transport layer, and then we have, here we have multiple bindings to multiple transport protocols. Uh, there is UDP, and then on top of UDP, there can be a security layer provided by DTLS. There is TCP, and again, with the transport layer security TLS. There is transport over SMS, both on device and without any security, and on smart card or on device pro, uh, secured with DTLS. And there are also bindings to non-IP data delivery with LoRaWAN and cellular IoT. So now let's co compare and contrast uh, MQTT and LWM2M, especially if we compare them with the challenges that we have set in the, in the beginning of this presentation. So if we, if we talk about security, there are two aspects that we are looking for. Uh, one is communication and the second is provisioning. If we talk about communication, then we have this transport layer security provided by the TLS and DTLS. We are putting this letter M here to emphasize that this is mutual authentication. The client is also authenticated, which is not the default operation of the TLS, the same for the TLS. And there is also OSCOR that provides application layer security. So this is especially important uh, because this is an end-to-end -end, uh, encryption of data. So for example, if, if you remember when I talked a moment ago about proxies, that proxies terminated the, the transport layer connection. So then the message would need to be decrypted and then re-encrypted again. So this prevents uh, proxy server from, from, seeing the, from seeing the message on the way from the device to the client device to the server. And then uh, for the raw MQTT, so this MQTT that is, is just with, without any structured payload, we have the TLS with the option to configure MTLS. And for the uh, and then we have we are also defining here a category for AWS IoT MQTT. This is the MQTT protocol provided by the AWS IoT service. So this is a sort of a custom protocol developed by AWS on top of on top of MQTT to provide the IoT service. And in this case, we have MTLS available by default by default. Then in terms of provisioning, we have the bootstrap interface that uh, provisioning is like uh, providing client credentials and uh, setting up access control. We have the bootstrap interface that does it. 
ROM QTT does not talk about uh, credentials provisioning at all, and AWS provides a separate provisioning service that does it for you. If we talk about the challenge of interoperability, open standards, the first aspect, LWM2M is an open standard, the same for raw MQTT. However, uh, AWS-based uh, MQTT is a proprietary solution. This means that it's, it's a custom protocol made on top of MQTT. And what is also important is that this is not uh, any solution for that you can take to any other cloud providers. Uh, it will not be working. If you take it, it will not be working out of the box if, if you move from AWS to, to Microsoft Azure. Then non-IP support, part of the LWM2M standard, not defined in MQTT. And for the transport bindings, as we have seen in the previous slide, there are multiple uh, available in ROM QTT and AWS IoT MQTT, only TCP is supported. If we talk about constraint devices, uh, all of these protocols uh, fulfill the requirement of lightweight protocol uh, for MQT, raw MQTT and for both MQTT, there is a very, you know, a very small header and message is, uh, there is a binary, binary format of the message. Uh, for LWM2M, we have the concise encoding with co-op. Payload encoding, multiple uh, formats supported by LWM2M, JSON, TLV, CBOR, CNML, OPAC. It's undefined, as Sam has mentioned, for raw MQTT. And for AWS IoT, uh, for AWS MQTT, many formats are supported. However, here I'm emphasizing this JSON as it's supported by default and it gives you the possibility to use many of the features provided by AWS out of the box related to uh, rule engines, device shadow, and so on. Gateway support. Uh, at the moment, no in LWM2N, but in the version 1.2, it's likely to be supported. For raw MQTT, there is this there, a little bit uh, like a little little brother, little little sister called MQTT SN, and this is also part of the this AWS IoT. And there is also a product called Greengrass that uh, AWS provides that can can play the role of a, of a gateway. Power saving capabilities. LWM2M provides the queuing mode, so device can go to sleep. And if there is some information, some message from it from the server, the server queues it until the device wakes up and sends a registration message to the server. And then the, and then the, the server has a chance to, to send the, the to, to deliver the, the, the queued messages to, to the device. And connectionless transport, so this is part of this uh, bindings to, to UDP based. Uh, it's it's uh, saves saves some sort of some part some fraction of the power that you don't need to need to use for establishing the connectivity with the TCP syn synac packets. Uh, no capabilities defined for uh, MQTT, and then AWS uh, provides the queuing mode as well. In terms of scalability, there we talk about resource discovery capabilities, part of LWM to M standard, not defined in raw MQTT. And there is some partial uh, functionality of it provided with the device shadow functionality in AWS. And then availability, in terms of availability, we talk about monitoring tools and all of these systems supported. Thank you.